Hello and welcome to my presentation on a randomized controlled trial on embedded computer language switching. I'm Merlin Drews and my co-authors were Cole Peterson, Bonita Sharif and Andrea Stefik. So to talk about computer language switching, we first have to talk about polyglot programming. Polyglot programming is the activity in software development where we switch between programming languages to develop something that includes having to read code, we having to change code, having to write new code, and that doing that in multiple programming languages. And um, this is actually really prevalent in software development. When you look at uh, open source repositories, you find that 97% of open source repositories actually have more than one computer language. Um, that averages up to five per project. And uh, generally we found that there's like about 24 general purpose programming languages in common use today. Uh, also, when you ask programmers how uh, many programming languages they know well, they say six um, and 10 overall. So that's also really interesting when you think about all the knowledge that a developer needs to have to be able to keep up with all those languages. Also, uh, one uh, motivation of all of this is, hey, how do, much does it actually cost when we develop software? And there's 103,000 uh, median salary for US developers. There are about uh, 1.2 million uh, developers in the United States and the software industry is a $407.3 billion industry. This means that if we can help uh, improve some development time, even if it's just a percent or two, we could actually cut down uh, significant costs uh, across the industry. So we are hoping to be able to do that with our research at least a little bit, or move in the right direction at least. Also, there's a personal uh, stake in this whole programming language switching thing, in that when I was a grad student, we had to switch between programming languages a bunch to be able to build all the things we wanted to build. Uh, one of the things was we had to switch between uh, a programming language with and one without semicolons. And I found myself mixing that up all the time, for example. But there's also other uh, perspectives on this. Like maybe a language has, doesn't have a for loop. Maybe a language doesn't have a while loop or something like this. You keep forgetting the language look similar and really is confusing. So I was looking into research on uh, what we could uh, find regarding this, and um, I didn't really find much in computer science other than that uh, developers actually use similar brain areas uh, when they switch between, uh, sorry, when they meet, read code as when they read text, normal natural language text. So when I didn't find anything in computer science on computer language switching, I decided to look into linguistics. In linguistics, there is a phenomenon called code switching. And um, I looked into that a little bit, and it's really interesting, a little bit out of the scope of this uh, talk, but um, they essentially found that there is a time cost to switching between languages, even in speakers that do it really uh, often and really uh, quickly, you can still measure a hesitation when switching between languages. Um, so I was wondering if we could find a similar effect in polyglot programming as well, uh, since we saw that like maybe the brain areas are related and stuff. So for that, I wanted to first think about what kind of switches there are in computer language switching. And the one most obvious one is like we work on a project, it's PHP, mainly maybe some JavaScript or HTML, and then we switch to something else, like maybe it's another web project, but it has a Java backend or something. And so we like switch between projects, maybe that's on a daily basis. For some, it might be every couple months they switch a project for work or something. Uh, but it is uh, certainly a switch that could happen, and it's a switch between sets of languages that happens a lot, I think. Um, then there's the file switching, uh, which is a switch between two files in the same project that um, have different programming languages. So for one, maybe writing some code on the back end, 
exposing some API endpoint or something in PHP. And then you switch to JavaScript to uh, send, a, send a request to that endpoint. But this could, this could happen more rapidly than the project level switch, but also it's not quite clear how often this does happen. And then there's the embedded switch. That's the one that we want to talk about here because that was really relevant for one of our projects. We wanted to see, hey, how do we actually query databases? And um, one pattern that we found was that um, JDBC, for example, lets you in embed S uh, SQL strings into Java statements. Uh, so like you're like, oh, cool, cool. Uh, here, execute this query, and then you write a string, and then it has a SQL in it. And that happens within the file, right? Like you write some code um, for, for database communication and it just um, executes the query, sends stuff to the database, uh, gets stuff back. Um, when you write this code, you have to switch between Java and SQL and switch back to Java or maybe even back and forth, depending on how you develop this. And um, I was wondering, what does this affect? Uh, how does this affect people? And um, for this, we uh, set out with three research questions that came from this like um, this interest in this. Um, for one, is there a measurable difference uh, between in productivity between programmers uh, when programmers switch between programming languages? Um, the uh, second one was, do people actually consciously experience uh, switches between computer languages? And the third was, hey. Um, is there a difference in productivity between participants who speak English natively and those who don't? That's a kind of a, a secondary question that came up uh, during uh, the look into natural language research in, in this regard. And uh, we were interested to, to give this a shot. We were not really uh, satisfied with the results in this paper. And this needs uh, some more in-depth work, but we'll get to that later. So... For this to work, we needed uh, an environment to run our experiment in. So we use uh, our experiment code, um, our experiment platform. It's a web platform. Uh, on the right side, you can right now see a screenshot with highlighted areas um, of which uh, of, of our platform on how we look at code snapshots that it records. It also records task time by automatically testing the code when, when a participant says, I'm ready, try this. And then like it runs uh, automatic uh, test cases against it. And this is how we record our time, uh, the time that we care about in productivity. It has automated consent form. It has automated rec uh, randomization, code editor, um, and it also records all these snapshots that we can scroll through on, on this like page that I'm showing there and the outputs that it uh, generated at the time. And otherwise it looks like this. It has like a bunch of survey up front um, that uh, we can also technically change, but we mostly use the same one. It records all kinds of information about their uh, status of education, their age, uh, their um, gender, if they want to disclose it, um, their experience with different programming languages, and uh, their experience in different classes. Um, then we have uh, the hard piece of this uh, application is um, actually the, the view where we, on the right side we have an editor where they can write their code. Uh, and on the left side, we have samples um, that help them f understand what they need to write um, and instructions and stuff that come uh, also go on the left side. And further down, there's the button that you can press to compile the code and uh, have it tested and also output for um, what the compiler actually tells us or the test case tells us. So, Let's go to the study design that we actually came up with using this tool also. We made a repeated measures design, uh, double blind, of course. Um, we measured time as productivity. That means time until tasks were complete. I alluded to them a couple of times. Um, we have these test cases. We write test cases for each task. The test cases have to be satisfied to be able to move on with the task. And when they are satisfied, or the 45-minute timer runs out, 
the task is ended. So um, a successful task is some time un under 45 minutes um, and um, it only ends when you satisfy the, the, ta um, the, the test cases. And so we wanted to make uh, participants switch between the host language and the embedded language. For that, we made three groups. I'll go through the details of these later, but basically there's a string group that is the polyglot, standard polyglot implementation. Uh, they have to switch between Java and SQL. We have the object-oriented group that's the monoglot implementation. They have a, they have a um, library uh, that's built into the experiment where um, it can write all the queries just in Java. And then we have a hybrid group where the difficult parts of the object-oriented implementation are done in string-based uh, conditions. Um, so we were hoping that would be the easiest uh, group to, to use. It is kind of a different implementation of Polyglot, um, where you might argue it's a quicker switch to a not as complete a switch um, for, for Polyglot. So when we look at those, here you can see, yeah, you write some code, and uh, some, some Java code, and then you add the SQL query um, so as highlighted here in a string. Then you have the object-oriented group where you don't have uh, the only strings are the, the field, the names of the columns. Uh, and you build the query conditions, for example, with a chain of method calls. And then we have um, the hybrid group where the condition is replaced by a string instead because it's easier, in our opinion, to, to write. And uh, then we come to results of the actual experiment. So we ran this, uh, we had 109 ex participants that finished the uh, experiment. 33% um, of those were female. Uh, we had about the most, the, the, the median, um, the mean age of participants was 24. We had 75% of the people were native English speakers. And um, as you can see in the box plot on the right side, we had about an even performance for our hybrid and string-based groups. Uh, obviously, um, the y-axis is time in seconds to complete tasks on average. Um, so lower is better, <laughs> basically is higher productivity, and higher is um, worse. And you can see in the object-oriented group that the uh, they were uh, slower than the other two groups. Uh, we ran an ANOVA on this, we found a significant effect for, for the difference between groups um, with a small um, effect size of 3.9% of the variance accounted for. Um, we, when we look at the graph, we see uh, the graph of break, break, broken down by group and experience level. We see that the hybrid group is relatively good across the board. Uh, while the string-based group has um, freshmen and sophomores uh, failing a lot of tasks, they, they're hitting the ceiling time, the maximum time you can take, and um, then having a little bit better performance for the junior, seniors, and professionals than the hybrid group. And then the object-oriented group has the first three levels failing a lot of tasks and the other two doing okay, mostly. Since I'm talking about failing tasks, here's the bar graph of the failure rates. So the amount of times people have failed tasks completely in the different groups, but broken down also again by experience. You can see the failure rate in the hybrid group is generally low. The um, failure rate in the string-based group is higher for the first two, the freshmen and sophomores. Object-oriented uh, group, the failure rate is relatively high across the board, but, but for professionals and seniors, and um, pretty high for freshmen especially. Uh, then here's the graph representing the difference between English as a primary language. Um, we did find a significant uh, difference um, between they have a primary English uh, knowledge and they don't. Um, one problem with this is that we recorded a primary English skill by asking them in the survey if they're primary English speakers. And we found some really mixed 
answers from people that are clearly also primary English speakers that, or, and some people that didn't uh, feel like they are primary English speakers that are, still have really high English skills is uh, kind of messy. And after talking with some um, linguists about this, it should have probably been better assessed by uh, using a proper English uh, proficiency exam, like a TOEFL score, for example. And um, therefore, I wouldn't put too much stake in these results. So when we come to a result overview, uh, we did find a difference between groups. Uh, it's a small uh, effect. The uh, monoglot group did the worst, so the object oriented group did the worst, basically. Um, the string-based group did okay with more experienced people, but not so good with beginners. Um, there's, we think that is mostly because uh, the more experienced developers also have more experience with a SQL or the ideas of SQL. And um, the hybrid group did the best. I think it was because it was very simple uh, of a design compared to the other ones. And it seemed to be very easy for, for the beginners also to understand. Uh, we did find significant differences between primary and natural languages, but we are not so sure that they, those results are actually generalizable. Also, um, we found that monoglot can be, uh, overall we found that monoglot can be difficult, um, especially when it's hard to express certain ideas like these conditions in a uh, monoglot format. And uh, there are clearly differences between different ways of doing programming language switching polyglot. And with that, we come to the end. I thank you very much for, um, for watching and please check out our replication packet. Uh, you can find it under this uh, URL. Um, we got three badges for it, um, available, reusable and functional. We hope you'll find interesting stuff with our application package, we included data analysis scripts, um, screenshots. We had um, also the source code for the um, for the environment we used to do the experiment with. So I hope uh, you can do something cool with this uh, if, if you're interested. And thank you very much.